I'm glad to be with you today. And what I've done is prepared information on teams working together to take care of geriatric patients. My goal is for you to have your input. I really would prefer you to talk back to me and those of you that are at um, distant sites, if you also could talk back to me, I would appreciate that. We're going to talk, uh, our objective is to understand the concept of interdisciplinary team training and how the, that plays a role in patient management. The other thing I would like to do by the end of this time is that you would just feel energized as a member of your team and that you would feel like going back and working extra hard on taking care of these older people. And I had hoped that at the end we could watch a film. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that, but it, it's an uplifting thing that uh, might get us in the right perspective. Before we think about teams, we have to think about where we came from as far as health care. And back in the old days, in the earlier 1800s and before 1850, most of the care was done at home. There was a doctor, but there really wasn't much of anybody else to provide care. The, um, the mother of the family would be the other health care provider. The mother of the family would go out and um, get herbs and compound them and take care of the ordinary problems of the family. But then for the very um, sick things that happened in the family, the physician would be called. Uh, Mark Twain wrote that in the 1850s that a doctor would charge $24 a year for a whole family, and that included the medicines that you would prescribe for them. During this time, there was a high mortality rate. We really didn't know the causative agents for, um, for diseases. Uh, any surgeries that would be done, we really didn't understand the anatomy that well, and uh, people would either die of hemorrhaging or of infections. Now, by the 1870s, there was an awareness of public health issues. After the Civil War, ho use of hospitals increased. Now, by the 1900s, um, things are progressing. We do begin to have a nurse or two, and if you notice, these nurses are ready to take care of patients, and you can't see it real good up here, but in the picture, they're wearing high heels. I don't know how quickly your nurses could move today in high heels. Um, there was beginning to be a theory, a ger um, the germ theory, but it was not well uh, accepted in the U.S. Florence Nightingale had an idea about this, and uh, she wanted to make hospitals um, that would reduce, reduce chance of infection. And her uh, goal was once the hospital got filled up with infection, you simply would leave that hospital and build another building. But most people didn't agree with her, and it, hospitals didn't come about, and infection um, control didn't come about to somewhat later. Also back during the early 1900s, there was World, World War I, and a lot of the um, communicable diseases continued at that time. But World War II brought a different type of care. There, was a lot, there were a lot of um, veterans who had injuries that had to be taken care of, and rehabilitation came into being. Also, the mortality rate was decreased because uh, in 1946, synthetic penicillin was developed. Also, there was shell shock. And all of these things began to emphasize a different uh, types of care and different areas of care. World War II um, also brought about increased uh, participation by federal government in the care of, of people and in support of medicine. And as you might uh, expect, those of you that do work in the Veterans Administration system, the Veterans Affairs system, uh, this system proliferated during that time. Now, beginning in the 1960s to present day, you know that our knowledge base increased. We began to have a lot more specialty care. 
there were more and more hospitals. And the emphasis was on acute care. Cure was the norm. Cure versus care. And how to, take, how to pay for this? Well, back in uh, 1929, hospitalization was beginning to be costly and the first insurance was developed and that was Blue Cross of Texas. But now by the 1960s, uh, when Medicare came into being and Medicaid, more private insurances as third-party payers, HMOs. So healthcare cost is rising. And corporate America begins to consolidate um, hospitals. There are many different types of healthcare professionals now. There's, not, there's no longer just a doctor. There's no longer just a nurse. But there are uh, all kinds of therapists. There are audiologists. There are dietitians, social workers all kinds of people to take care of patients. You might also know that uh, the length of life is longer, and so we're beginning to have older people to take care of. So now we begin to think about um, how we're going to take care of these people, and the concept of teams came into being. And before we talk about teams directly, I just want to think about where have you been in your past life on teams? How many of you were ever on a football team, a debate team, a swim team, something in grade school, high school, you know, college, these kinds of things? All of the uh, experiences that you had there, they helped to mold you into the person you are so that you're the team member you are today on the healthcare team that you're in. One of the things I'd like you to do is just within your own mind right now, think about a self-evaluation and your strengths and the values that you carry, the expertise that you have and the abilities that you have um, on, that you bring to the team. You might ask yourself, where did I come from? Where am I going in five years? And where am I right now? And then we go back to why do we need a team approach for geriatrics? And because it brings greater expertise, greater commitment. It certainly divides the workload. One person cannot gather all the information that is needed to make good decisions about older people, nor then can they get all of that work done. It provides better comprehensive care. The focus of geriatric uh, management is on, and managing geriatric patients, is on management versus cure of that patient. The team approach can also cut down on fragmentation of care or duplication of services. A team is a group of people working together in a coordinated effort. There are various types of teams. These happen to be the four that the literature most um, cites. The unidisciplinary team is where there are a group of providers. They are of the same professional background. There's not really a leader to this team. This example is like occupational therapist. This might be a group of uh, professionals working in the same office, but they're not really um, communicating back and forth about patient care so much. The intradisciplinary team is where there is um, the same disciplinary background, but at different levels of expertise. Uh, this example is from a nursing service. You might have another example, say, from pharmacy, where you start from a farm D and go down to a farm pharmacy tech. There is a hierarchy here, and the one with the greatest um, amount of expertise is the one who would be in charge. As we're going through these teams, I want you to remember that the most important person on the team is the patient. This is a multi example of multidisciplinary team. This is a mix of both healthcare uh, professionals and social welfare professionals. 
These people may have diverse backgrounds, but they work in the same work site. They work independently, but alongside of each other. They don't work jointly together, though. They may consult back and forth. There's not really any team process on a multidisciplinary team. And generally, the highest ranking uh, professional is the person who is the leader of that team. The team that seems to um, be most accepted as the best model of team for geriatric care is the interdisciplinary team. Now this is a mix of professionals from diverse backgrounds. You work collectively together in the same program or same setting. You're interdependent on one another. Everybody on the team is an equal. Team process is very important. Leadership of this team may change. It depends on who has the information that is needed at the time as to who would be the leader of the team at that point. The interdisciplinary team works together to assure provision of comprehensive and coordinated care. Again, the patient is at the center of this team. And the most important aspect, I think, is that the whole is more important than the parts of the team. What are some of the pluses and minuses, the strengths and the weaknesses of having an interdisciplinary team? Well, the strengths that I could think of would be we come from a different perspective. It gives a more complete picture if different people are assessing that person. You bring greater expertise and you have more realistic decisions made for that patient. There's also patient advocacy that I think is very important. In geriatrics, you tend to have some of your patients for a very long time. I can think of one gentleman I have now that I have been seeing for 10 years. Well, there comes a time when I think I know everything about him or that he will uh, respond in this way or that way. And sometimes I need a team member to step up and actually be his advocate and say, no, this is going to be best for him. We need to try this for this patient. Okay, you think about, well, all right, we're going to use um, the interdisciplinary team approach. And so you say yes to it. And so you might want to meet some of the needs by the interdisciplinary approach for some of the older people in this picture. The older ones are the ones sitting down, I can tell you. Um, but are there any drawbacks to using that approach to meet their needs? Well, I think one of the biggest drawbacks but it's a necessity, it's a fact of life, is that weaknesses of, I'm sorry, the, the interdisciplinary team approach takes time. And in today's society, time equals money. So actually sometimes I wonder if, if this is the ideal versus reality today in using the interdisciplinary team as I, as I at least have thought of it um, for many years. Other weaknesses that people have, sometimes have to come to terms with is the way roles overlap. Different professionals' roles can bleed into another professional's area of expertise. There may be potential for conflict and sometimes there's a lack of common language. But even so, we want to try to use the interdisciplinary team because it can provide better patient care, continuity of care, and a sharing of load. It also, another benefit is just that you learn to respect one another's roles as professionals. Do you really know what 
the social worker can do for you or the speech therapist could do for you or do you really know um, what the physical therapist can do. A, a team can also increase morale and just actually give survival. What are the characteristics of a good team? Well, some of these, uh, the goal is to have coordinated care of that patient and the term, you know, of positive patient outcomes, but we do want to have decreased morbidity and mortality. We want to have increased functional status of the patient and to cut down the amount of time that they have to spend in a hospital and to better coordinate their care so it is no longer fragmented. There are a couple of goals also for the team itself, a team that works smoothly and efficiently together and a team that's effective, that we're not wasting a lot of time and we're not dawdling, but we can get ahead with the work that we have. What would be the purpose of your team? Well, you want to be able to screen for treatable diseases, make accurate diagnoses. You want to know that the person is actually living in the facility or the, the setting that is best for them. And you want to document change over time. Documentation is certainly a, a thing itself that is changing. Many of us are now going from a, a hard copy chart to an electronic record. Um, and that, that is an adjustment for teams. It's real important to have mutual respect among team members. Uh, to trust one another, and also for each team member to be committed enough that they're as good as they can be at their individual role. And that takes, you know, um, responsibility on each one of our parts to become more informed and more educated um, to, to be the best member of that team as we can. A few more of the characteristics of a team would be that they're patient focused and not individually focused. Don't let your ego get in the way. Give up some of the ownership of the territory. And again, I just put in here to be comfortable with the overlapping roles that you may come upon in working on a team. I think that this is the most important thing about a team that I'd want you to take away from here today. That a team member understands and appreciates one another's work style, one another's ethnic and cultural contribution, and the personality of one another is very important, as well as the professional role. You know, we can look at people's degrees and see what kind of professional job they do, but often, especially with the geriatric patient, it it matters as far as the ethnic and cultural background that the team member may have to approach that patient with. You know, I, I have many um, team members that really can get more out of a patient than I can get just because they relate to them better culturally than I could relate. Well, we're going to have a team who's going to be on that team. All kinds of professionals, and I've just listed some here, social workers, all kinds of therapists, nurses, physicians, audiologists, speech therapists, dietitians, pharmacologists. But I would not want us to forget the paraprofessionals, such as nursing assistants. Other people that might be loosely on a team might be the the people that actually deliver meals on wheels to a person's home every day, or the via trans driver. Or if you're working in a facility setting, it might actually be the person that works in housekeeping. That might be the person that the patient is talking to a lot throughout the day. How does a team function together? Well, there has to be effective team building. You have to know how to set goals and know what to expect from one another. 
You want to be able to make decisions. How do you make those decisions? And in some of your handouts, there are some, uh, some handouts about that, of how decisions are made and so forth. And you as a team have to come up with how you are going to do that. You have to also have a way to manage conflict and to be accountable to one another. You know, as far as accountability, it has to do with like, if you're going to have um, t staffing of a patient, like just before I came here today, I was, we had our weekly staffing. And so every team member is responsible to have reviewed that chart and made changes uh, in the patient's plan of care so that we know where we are with that patient. And when one team member has not done that, then it causes the whole team to lag behind. The thing that you need to ask yourself is what functions or roles do we need to get the job done? Now we can look at what uh, the theory is and what the model of interdisciplinary team is. But is that what our team needs? The other thing is how are we going to communicate? Do we have a lot of meetings? Is it more informal or formal? How do we document? Another thing is to also document or to look at the team process effectiveness. If it's not working this way, change it to something different. Some of the functions of the team would be patient assessment, planning that care, providing the direct care, evaluating the care, and then replanning once again because it's for sure all of our plans are not going to come out just the way we thought they would do. Let me go back here just a minute. You need to ask who does what and what kind of assessment you're going to use. In the setting that I work now, which has recently been renamed to the Day and Home Base Clinic because we've combined the um, adult day health care with the hospital-based home care, we are beginning where probably not every team member, uh, different professional, is going to assess the patient. We're going to go to use uh, the OASIS as a, an assessment tool and the nurse will be doing the assessments and within that we will key when other team members have to actually see that patient uh, depending on answers that might show that the dietitian may need to see the patient or the social worker might need to see the patient. Also in team process, you need to think about what are your facilities uh, expectations of you and of the care that you provide. When you're setting goals for a team, you also have to think about where you work and what are the goals of that facility. Are they looking at your team to generate uh, revenue and do you have to see so many patients uh, in a given time to generate that revenue? Evaluation should be on a systematic basis though and at scheduled intervals. Always trying to include the patient in the evaluation process. Too many times we set up goals that are our goals and they don't get met because the, they're not the patient's goals. I guess if, if there's anyone that would like to give some feedback on how their team is functioning and what their, um, their own personal experience is, um, if we could share back and forth, that would be good. Anybody want to talk about teams? Okay. Well, the other thing that I would like to say is that it's very important that you maintain the team that you do get developed it's essential for this. It's essential to the health of the team that for some way you uh, use formal times and informal times to come together and say, how is our team working? 
Do we need to change? Um, there are tools even that can evaluate the team function. It's really wonderful if you can schedule retreats. I think that in all the years that I've been on the team, I've been on one retreat. So sometimes you just have to do lunch and count that as your retreat. You also need to know that change is a given. You think that, oh, I have just the, the members on my team now that we're working well together, we are cohesive, and yet someone retires, someone gets ill and has to quit work. So there's always a change going on. Or because of the organization in which you work, there has to be changes made. A team's attitude and cohesiveness just do not happen. I must make it happen, and each one of us must have this attitude. We need not to think about uh, they should have and they ought to, but rather what I will do. What I would like to do now is there is a film. Uh, it's just about 10 or 15 minutes long, and it just provides... I think a setting that we could end on. I know this is just basic information. Yes, sir. Can you expand on the tools to evaluate the team function? Uh, yes. There, there are tools, and I don't know if I have one with me today, but I could get it for you. And actually, the way some people do in a team is they may have a leader of the team, a recorder of the team, and then an observer. And the observer would there is a tool and they would look at how all the different team is doing, the different team members are doing. In other words, some people may routinely sit there and never say a word. Someone else may be the chatterbox and they really um, monopolize the time and don't let other team members have their fair share. And so what you would do is you would mark on, it's like a scale, and you would mark on that for so much time and then at certain times within your team, you would give, say, five minutes to team maintenance and you would look back at that and see how, you know, the, the reaction of the scale. That's, that's one thing. Well, I wanted to uh, make a comment about you talking about from the perspective of um, being part of a large institution. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly you have uh, more staff and um, more methodology regarding doing geriatric care. Um, I run a small, a small clinic uh, along with the Santa Rosa Hospital, but mm -hmm. basically we are on our own in the clinic, mm -hmm. and I'm the team leader, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we do the staffing, and it's a constant communication. So we have the the patients are pleased, and the, the care is the best work, the best possible. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a constant feedback between me and the staff, and of course, the staff is reduced because the the yes. situation of uh, make to make this not not to staff intensive because again, it's very costly. Yes. Uh, so we don't have any you know specific tools to evaluate the team or whatever, but rather it's some sort of constant communication. And the, uh, the yardstick is basically the satisfaction of the patients, or yes. at the same time, what kind of complaints uh, they might have. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, we always, uh, all the time, look at the charts and make sure that uh, like the, the forms and the assessments are, are completed. Yes. Um, make sure that, the, um, that all the, uh, the preventive measures and the education that the patient need is there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, situation in which uh, we uh, deal with uh, a fair number of uh, Hispanic. Uh, many of them are just Spanish speaking, and their sophistication is not that much. Right. So in those patients, really, we, uh, uh, we uh, put a little bit of intensity about mm -hmm. correcting their chronic diseases and and, uh, or rather, you know, managing the problems, and so mm -hmm. they they do the best way possible. And, yes. And always there is a lot of teaching to the patients regarding uh, functional decline. 
Right. And make sure that they have the best uh, aging process uh, possible, the best yes. work possible. Teaching is one of the yeah. basic, you know, teaching is one of the basic things that you can do and reinforcing of that teaching, you're right, so that they're as good as they can be. And you work very hard just to maintain them at the functional level they are. And it takes all of you to do it. But it's quite clear that uh, the, the geriatric care is, uh, by definition, have to have some intensity. And yes. I don't know how to reconcile this with the fact that, uh, you know, nowadays there is a lot of cuts. Yes. Uh, uh, regarding healthcare, and mm -hmm. for example, uh, I don't think so that managed care, mm -hmm. HMOs are uh, going to do a, mm -hmm. a meaningful uh, geriatric care, mm -hmm. because again, it needs some intensity. Uh, right. And, and they are I looking always the bottom line. Yes, I I don't see um, interdisciplinary team and and HMOs. Co, you know, I don't see an interdisciplinary team and an HMO. Do you? Uh, you know, I don't think well, that would. Well, uh, actually, we don't see HMOs because again, right, uh, those right. patients do require uh, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cons a lot of uh, work on them. Mm -hmm. uh, we just mm -hmm. cannot see patients uh, on HMO. Uh, right. Uh, and again, there uh, there are some seniors that have little problems. Th those that's no problem. That's correct. Uh, healthy ones, etc. But, but generally, the ones that have problems have the, lots yeah, of problems. Yeah, those uh, require a lot of uh, work and a lot of. Uh, uh, I like, I, the care has to be intense at a certain point. Yes, yes. You're right. You're right. Are there any other comments or questions? Lily, do we have 10 or 15 minutes? Yes. Okay. Okay. What I'd like to do is I think I'd just like to go ahead and uh, finish with the film. This is a film. Uh, I think it'll keep you uh, engaged. I've liked this film just because it ends on a positive note and though it's not um, to totally geared toward health care, it, um, it is very applicable just to um, what we are trying to do. Jeffrey.
It's the place to start if you want to develop into the best team player you can possibly be. I started life more like a sparrow than an eagle. I was a kid in a poor part of Houston. I came from a broken home. I didn't have very many opportunities. But I was a kid with a dream. I wanted to be a success in the classroom and on the football field.
be recognized as the finest football team in the world. And because we had a clear and common goal, knew where we were going, we all danced to the same music. Next, we had to learn the abilities of other players on the team. This was a little harder because to do it, you have to pay attention to the needs of your teammates and not just yourself. You have to ask, can your strengths balance my weaknesses? Can my strengths balance your weaknesses? Can we compensate for one another for the good of the team as a whole? Our third lesson was harder still. Learn to communicate with others on your team. This can be brutal because some of the things you have to share may not be very pleasant. You have to strike the proper balance between positive and negative feedback or it can be devastating. You have to say the good things without being stingy or selfish. You have to say the bad things without being cruel or destructive. And you have to listen to criticism. Get mad. Get over it. Get better. It's a bruising experience, but it makes a team grow strong. Number four took a lot of concentration. Perfect your craft. You can't become the best on good attention alone. You have to know what you're doing and keep getting better at it. You have to ask another question, read another report, share another idea. You have to know that you'll never learn everything. Recognize that there's always more to know, but still understand the brutal truth that if your knowledge and ability stop growing, you and your team will stop growing. And in the end, you'll lose. There was one more lesson to learn, and it was really tough. We had to learn the execution. If you're truly an eagle, and you know your craft, you already know how to do your part. But you have to learn how to make your skills mesh perfectly with those of everyone else on your team. That takes practice, hard knocks, experience, failures, and successes. Until everyone on the team shares one mind, one face of action, and your execution is absolutely perfect. If you want to play on a winning team, you can't miss assignments. You can't drop minor details. You can't be anything less than completely involved. Five simple but difficult lessons. That's what it took to turn a bunch of eagles into a team. A team that was ready, ready to win. We had learned to trust each other. We had learned to talk out problems and reach a resolution. We had learned to tear down walls. We had learned to share the dangers and the heartaches. And at the end of one of the most successful seasons in NFL history, we did it. We won the Super Bowl. We were the best. We were flying high. We were a team of eagles, even though they called us bears. <laughs> we didn't realize it at the time, but we had one more lesson to learn about being a team. And this lesson was gonna be the toughest of all. We didn't think anyone could ever beat us again. Perhaps nobody could have. We beat ourselves instead. Pride, selfishness, complacency, those became our new enemies. We got greedy. Each of us began to think that he was the reason we were so successful. We became independent. Each one of us thought 
He really didn't need the other guy. I don't need him. And he doesn't need me. What he does is his business. We'll just come in, do a job, and that's it. We started to play the game of blame. When something went wrong, we turned to excuses. We lost a special kind of strength. The ability to take the heat yourself. We stopped communicating. We stopped sharing our goals and balancing our skills. We lost our vision. We forgot the lessons that made teammates out of Eagles in the first place. We stopped playing as a team. We weren't even Eagles anymore. We were carrying too much personal baggage. And the result, we never, ever saw a Super Bowl again. I hope you never have to learn the lesson we did. We didn't understand that a team, even a team of Eagles, is a very special and fragile thing. A team is like a family. It's held together with honesty, trust, and respect. Each one of us has our own place in the family. And if one of us doesn't come through, the family's gonna hurt. Not long ago, my wife Kim gave birth to our youngest child, a little girl named Jack. Our two middle kids fell in love with the baby. They played with her, they rocked her, they sang her songs. But Kristen, our oldest, kept herself apart. She didn't want to hold the baby. She didn't want to talk about it. She wasn't playing on the team. Finally, I took Kristen aside. I reminded her of how much I treasured the day she was born. Then I explained to her what her job was now. I asked her to teach the baby, to share with Jacqueline everything she herself had learned while she was growing up. When I finished, Kristen's face lit up with a big, big smile. She said, I can do that, Daddy. I can do that. At that moment, Kristen learned that on a team, everybody has to do their part. On a team, everybody has to know that his or her job is the most important job of all. On a team, everybody has to be involved. There can't be any dead weight. It's too heavy. It's too costly. On a team, if one person comes up just a little bit short, someone else has to step in and fill the gap. On a team, if someone has a problem, it becomes everybody's problem. ever get to the point where we think the person next to us, or the person under us, or the person over us is not important, we'll come crashing down, no matter how high we fly. You see, the great individual ability of the ego has to be there, or you can't even play the game. But a team, a team of egos, committed to one another what it takes to win. That's it, Jeffrey. Right here to set up other equipment. Bear with us and we'll see you after break.